Good. This was very easy. I, you know, I haven't done Google Talk before. Or Google, is this called Google Talk or Google Hangouts? It, it's called Google Hangouts. And uh, even more specifically, this is Hangouts on air. Yes. So the on air part means that it's uh, broadcasted live, although you can set it to be private. But um, in the on air site, you can see all sorts of broadcasts that are happening live that people are exposing to the public. And it's there for people to watch live as well as to uh, look at later. Oh, great, great. So uh, it's, uh, it's an even better concept than Skype, I think. Also, it's very easy to share your screen. Uh, so that's another reason pe people prefer Skype. OK. If, uh, we can get started whenever you're ready. OK, I'm ready. So uh, Gotham, I'm going to record our comment, if you don't mind. and. Yeah. Um, what I'll do is I'll make sure that you're, uh, you have the opportunity to review all the material before anything gets uh, published anywhere. Would that be our? Yeah, that's fine. OK, great. All right, Gotham, can you, uh, first of all, congratulations on um, you know, all the success it, it seems that you've had with, with your intro to finance MOOC. Can you tell me uh, just briefly how you got involved in that? and, and what made you want to get started in, in uh, developing a MOOC? Yeah, so uh, Coursera contacted uh, University of Michigan along with, I believe, three of the school, three or four other universities more than a year ago, right when they were about to launch, uh, and wanted uh, to see if there would be partners in this new thing called a MOOC. And our university agreed to, and they asked deans of various schools and colleges to nominate people. And I was in the first group of people nominated. So I got this email, which is a very funny email, from the provost's uh -huh. office, basically saying, do you want to teach thousands of students in the, you know, in the text right. header? And I was about to delete it because, you know, you get these emails. And then I realized it was from our provost's Bam. office. Is now. So I said, sure. So I jumped right in. I didn't know what I was getting into, but it has been quite a ride. So, yep. Skeptical at first? Sorry? Were you skeptical initially? Yeah, I did it because I didn't believe it would possibly work. I mean, you have taken my class, and I'm extremely. Uh, open-ended in my teaching. I do have a script, but I rarely stick to it in live class. So I, I pay a lot of value to being there with people live. So this notion of being asynchronous on a video seemed like a bizarre idea, and but on the other hand, very challenging. So the, the, that's why I said yes. I was very skeptical. I see, I see. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the numbers? I know the initial uh, class had uh, uh, over 100,000. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. So, so the way this works is we offered it once, and it was offered two months after I said yes, which was a challenge. I agreed to do it and then had to produce the whole class uh, over the summer. Uh, uh, but the first one, uh, offering was in middle or summer of uh, 2012, and it lasted a specific time. I guess you know this about Coursera classes, okay. is that they run like regular yeah. classes. They're not open all the time. So in the first offering, I had over 130,000 students. And that blew my okay. mind. But after about <laughs> 5,000, it doesn't really matter whether you have 10, 20, 30, or 40 at some level. So yeah. But then I'm, I've am i offered it three times again. We now in are in a cycle where we'll offer it uh, three times a year. And the numbers do fall. But if I look at my current enrollment, and there, there are various ways of looking at it. People enroll, and you many people don't even come to the site after that. right? Sure. But if I look at sure. my enrollments, on my current site, they have remained, even in new classes, over 80,000. 
Now, how many of them complete, how many of them come every time, obviously changes over time. But the interesting part is because it's finance probably, the enrollments have remained extremely high, you know, uh, in uh, general. So cumulative, cumulative enrollments for all four uh, courses that you've offered then, what, what is that number? It, it seems like it's... Uh, th uh, 350 or or more? Yeah, if you assume that they are independent people, so the people in yeah. the first could also enroll in the second one, and I don't think we bar people from sure. re-enrolling, or Coursera does. Sure. But if these are independent ones, so I would say about 350 to 400K, something like that. Okay, okay. Now, Gotham, what, how does that number compare to your own estimate of how many students you've taken person in, in your teaching career. Do you have any general oh, sense yeah, of that? I, I have a very good sense. So I teach about, I teach a large fraction of our students, about 200 out of 400 or 250, which is, but even if it's 250 times 25, uh, uh, it's not a very large number, right? So 250 times 20 right. is what? 5,000? So, yeah. So 5,000. So in a lifetime, I, I couldn't possibly teach so many people, right? I see. Uh, so Gotham, tell me, why do you think the response has been so strong to the to finance class around the world? Mm. I think that things that are very applicable and everywhere in your life have had strong uh, um, class sizes. And I think the good news about finance, at least the way I think about it, is that it's applicable to just about anything you do. So I think whether you're looking at it from a personal education point of view or for a professional reason, finance is almost the, you know, the, the, if you don't know finance, I don't think you know how to manage your stuff or how to understand <laughs> stuff that you do on a daily basis. And the fact that it applies to I you see. in your personal life as well as professional life, there's an inherent demand out there. I think that's the main reason. I would say, for I see. Example, but there's two things. Yeah, sorry, social networking, psychology classes. Yes. Uh, are also very high uh, enrollments. So, so it's sure. because everybody's interested in these issues. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's, uh, there's two things there. One is uh, the importance of finance, which you just mentioned. There's people recognizing that it's important. And that also must be true around the world. Yes. I see. Yes. And it's, uh, it's, uh, the point you're making is it's like, to me, when I think about English, the reason why English has taken off, who knows, but it has taken off and it's like a common language these days in the world that everybody uh -huh. tries to learn to be able to communicate. Same way I think of yes. finance. Finance is, doesn't ha is a language on its own that everybody needs to know, regardless of where you are. So that's the advantage of I it. See. So, yeah. Sure. And do you have a sense, Gotham, from your online students, uh, they're applying this more towards work or more towards uh, their personal life? Do you have examples of of um, of ways that they've been apply applying this in their lives? Yeah. So the right now, what we are doing is we are trying to do research on MOOCs to answer questions like that. To give you a answer that's data based and intensive is not possible right now. Okay. The other thing okay. is I also encourage students not to contact me because if you have 130,000 students and people email you, you're, you know, you're basically screwed, right? So you have nothing else to do. Sure. sure. But I do know a few things that are data-based. One, most MOOCs are taken by people who already have some kind of formal training. Data suggests that they're being taken by people who have some kind of degree or, or already. So that data is pretty f serious and across the board. The sad news about that data is it is MOOCs are not going to people who actually could benefit the most from them. 
but hopefully that that will happen over time. But right. focusing right. on who are who have taken the MOOCs now, the 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 anecdotal evidence through emails to me is mostly these are people who are going to use it in their work because they I've gotten emails like I've done a finance the best kind of emails I get is I had already done a class but I didn't know how okay. to, what finance was and now I can apply it to my job okay. so it's either that or application to personal financial problems like taking a mortgage or investing in the stock market so both of those are equally important, but I think more so job-related understanding of finance. It may not be that you become a finance person, but you understand your business better. So I think it's more the more of these kinds of people. Right, right. And of all the concepts that you are teaching in this class, um, are there any concepts that stand out as being the most valuable for students or creating the biggest aha moments for them? Yeah, I think the biggest aha moment comes from the fact that it doesn't matter where you apply finance. The, the aha moment is finance doesn't change. It's the application that changes. And people are blown away by that. So the fundamentals of finance apply to any kind of problem, whether you're doing a business decision, you're taking a mortgage, you're taking a loan, you're starting a new firm. That's the biggest aha of this class, in fact. They find that a few principles, if you know them well, you can take on any real world problem and, you know, run with it. To sure. Some extent, so, 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 so God, briefly, what are those few principles? How would you describe those few principles? The f most important principle is just how do you value stuff. Is value creation is doesn't depend on a firm, doesn't depend on a person, doesn't depend on the government. It is almost a thing on its own. So to use financial language, there are two components of value creation. One is your cash flows, there, and the other one is how do you take time value and discounting into account. Now those are the only two okay. things we know in finance. We pretend we know a lot more. But just recognizing how those two things repeatedly come up in every problem you face in life. And if you understand those two, you kind of... I see. So the toughest aha moment is also the aha moment that's toughest in the real class, in the life class. And that is compounding. Uh -huh. uh, the notion of how compounding, compounded growth or compounded discounting is so powerful, the human mind can't capture it because it's nonlinear, it's not straightforward, it's not additive. I see. That is the most difficult thing that people find to internalizing. You know what I mean? And yeah, is the is it that they struggle with the concept or they struggle with? Um, the calculation, or are they so interrelated that um, interrelated. they struggle with both? Yes. So the notion is, you said no, which is the aha moment. I'll call this the aha moment that happens repeatedly, even to me, is that you understand okay. <laughs> intellectually, you do problems, you see it happening, and still if somebody asks you a simple question like, how much do you think 100 bucks at 10 in 10 percent interest rate would be 100 years from now? People don't have a clue of how large it could be if the interest rate is 10 percent versus say 1 percent these days, right? So if the so I the see. impact of a low interest rate versus a high interest rate is so profound that even informed people don't understand it even after practicing it. So that to me is the major financial issue. I see. Yeah, yeah. I, so that, that reinforces the importance of actually crunching the numbers because trying to estimate what they are in your head is not necessarily intuitive. Yes. In fact, research shows that humans are very, very uncomfortable with nonlinear things. We tend <laughs> to predict things linearly and it shows up in every kind of context. So for example, when you think of the environmental ecosystem, it's not a linear thing. Things grow with each other. They grow in very nonlinear ways. They are tipping points in weather and so on. 
humans are terrible at such stuff. All of us. Right. So I think finance has that built into its thinking, and that's what creates the aha moment repeatedly. I see. Well, uh, gaining this aha moment or or studying finance, do students more of an intuition for for this, yes. or do they simply yes. know it at an intellectual level? No, and, no, no. They develop more yeah. of an intuition. They don't guess as easily as before because guesses are usually wrong. They come from some kind of a linear projection. The other aha moment is that value is always incremental. By that I mean is you don't think of value in absolute ways anymore once you do finance. Finance makes force you to think about what are you doing over and above what's already happening in the world, which is a very simple idea, but people screw up repeatedly in an analysis. For example, in a competitive environment, you think your product is unique. Not true. Everybody is trying to create a similar product. So the value of your product is not the product stand alone, but how good it is relative to some existing or potential product. Am I making so? So Samsung creates a new phone. It looks great on its own, but everybody is comparing it to Apple. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that little issue, which is a real aha moment, is value is never absolute. It's always relative. Yeah. That's another. That, piece that's that a great point. point. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Gotham. One of the things that uh, um, examples I I often say is that um, I can go right now and spend 15 minutes on the Apple uh, App Store and find some great for free that provide me a great deal of value. I can already do that today. So, um, you know, people who come up with business ideas that create value, it doesn't necessarily it is incremental value because all these other options are available. I think that's exactly what you're that's describing. That's right. Uh, Gotham, you, you talked about these uh, in the course. Um, uh, what, uh, are there any points in the course where it is um, more difficult and uh, is that related to any um, change in a dropout rate for your course? No, I think the data shows that uh, completion rates are about 5%. That is people who actually get certificates. Mm -hmm. But that 5% is uh, for classes that you know, have a lot of homework and assignments and so on. And my class is structured to be difficult. So, in fact, the biggest criticism I get, and I'm, I don't do much about it, is that my problem sets are much more difficult than what problems I do in class. Well, that's by design, because you learn on your own. I can't teach you. That's my philosophy. And the way you right. learn is actually going from what I call the Legos I provide to building different designs, and that's what's in your assignment. So the 5% is for people who actually do all the assignments. I have 10 assignments, I have exams, which is a huge number in my book. Because if you take 5% of 100,000, you have 5,000 students who actually get certificates, right? So, so these right. are people who work on their own, work hard, are working full-time otherwise, or doing something else, and then do this. So to me, the the tougher part of the class is not what's the problem. The problem is happens very early in the class. People come in, they see the videos of the first, and then they see the first assignment. And uh -huh. by the last few questions of the first assignment, they know this is not going to be easy. I see. So it's not over time that the rate falls. It's They know pretty quickly whether they are going to do it or not. I see. So the converse of that then is that if someone in class and they complete the first assignment successfully and they enjoy it or appreciate it or think that it's valuable, it's likely that they will be able to complete the rest of the class. Absolutely uh, right. I see. And they will not be interested. There's so much self-selection going on that there will be people who will be very disappointed if they don't actually get a certificate, not just that. Sure. So there's, 
so, so I, I wanted to say something about this completion rate while I have some air time. I mean, there's a lot of okay. controversy. People yeah. are talking about, oh, very few completions. Well, when people come face-to-face -face classes, they cruise in the first week to see which classes they should take, right? So when you were mm -hmm. here, people register for far more classes than they take. And so if you look at completion rates, even in real-time class, and only look at people who showed interest in the class, completion rates will look half as much for a tough class than they would otherwise. Right. Right? Right. Because twice as many people right. look at your class than who actually take your class. Right. It's, it's a different denominator. That's right. That's right. That's right. But, but Gautam, you mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned a 5% figure for certificate, but surely uh, a lar that's a, a subset of people who are getting a lot of value out of the class, perhaps most of the work. Um, do, you have a, do you have any data on what proportion of your students are maybe not getting a certificate, but largely participating, doing uh, the majority of the work? Is that a bigger figure than the 5%? Yes. I, w I can, okay, so that's a tougher number to figure because there's no accurate way to measure it. But to give you some sense, uh -huh. and I have a lot of data from the first offering, what really blew my mind is that people were watching my last week's video were over 80,000 people. So, okay. so the in terms of so, okay, they could be watching my video because I'm funny. I mean, that's clearly a possibility. Though I think I'm funny, <laughs> others don't think. But the the thing that appears to me is that people are willing to learn from the videos. Maybe not do all the assignments, but to me, that's highly mm -hmm. valuable. I think to, even though I'm at a university, I don't believe that learning should only happen at a university. Uh, learning should happen yeah. because you want, you are interested. So my favorite examples are a telephone message from a person from Israel left a telephone message. He is 80 plus and he left a message wow. saying, I always wanted to learn finance and now I know finance. Then there are emails from 12-year-olds saying, I don't want to take my math class, but I want to take your finance class because it's so applicable. But my mom says you should do an AP class. So I, of course, said, listen to your mom. <laughs> don't listen to me. So it, it's right. that variety that actually excites me, not necessarily the 5% who get the certificate. You, you see what I'm saying? Sure. So, yeah, you learn. I, I absolutely see Sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, next thing I want to ask you is, uh, uh, what are there things that you've learned from your online students? Yes. You learned from them or, or from teaching them? Yes. I have learned, uh, what I've learned is that there is a lot of value to teaching people the way they want to learn. Even though I have taught for so many years, when I'm live in the classroom, my ability to figure out how people learn differently is very limited because I am only one person over there and I teach in a certain way, uh -huh. right? And my style is very off the wall. If somebody asks a question, I spend 15 minutes on it. So what I learned <laughs> from this is that this format is so different from what I do in real time that it's not me anymore. So the value add is that people learn in different ways. At least I now have two versions of what I can do for people to learn. So for example, people who come on campus, they now get frustrated in my classes. Many, 10% of my class says I can never learn from him because he's so off the wall, he's so yeah. confusing. They now have a very structured way of uh -huh. learning. So, so to me, if we have more combinations of hybrid ways of teaching, the more value we'll add. So to me, that was the revelation that the person teaching online is not me anymore. It's somebody who's different and has value add for <laughs> a different person. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, yeah, it does. So, so you're saying that you've actually used content for the online class and le and 
supply it as a resource to your in-class students? Is that That's correct? That's right. That's right. So, for example, I teach advanced classes, and whenever somebody asks me a question, I have a desire to answer it. But now what I do mm -hmm. is, to my own students in advanced classes, I have a version of the resources of this class available. So I say, wait a second. 80% of the class understands this question, 20% doesn't. I'm not going to take up the time of 80% to take care of the 20. So I'm very in your face. So I say, if you don't understand this, go, it's available. And I'm not sending you to a live class that you have to take next semester. It's already available. So I do that. Yes, I do that. And it works. That's fantastic. It's, it's really an opportunity for you to do blended blended learning. Um, Gotham, one, one thing that I'm curious about, um, with the students that you have in person, they are obviously a, a highly selected group. I mean, uh, University of Michigan and a largely business-focused, you know, highly career-oriented or individuals. And now with the online MOOC, you're obviously reaching a, a much more diverse population. Do you notice any differences how they want to learn, but do you notice any differences about what uh, the two bodies of students? Uh, what they uh, are attracted to and what they find easy, what they find difficult. Uh, are, are they similar or are they, they different in some ways? So the differences are less dramatic than I had imagined because of the population that has currently taken MOOCs. So the, the difference in the, mm. the way you describe people, if the people coming into MOOCs were much more diverse, in their backgrounds and economic conditions and so on, and their training, then the comparison would be more stark. It's not as stark as I would have thought. But having said that, and there's another thing, people who participate on forums and you can monitor what they are saying are again a yes. self-selected part of the MOOC crowd. So, the, mm, so right. right now I would say there's a lot more similarity between people who come to MBAs and people who participate actively in my MOOC. But there is a much larger audience that I also hear from through forums. And these are people who are not necessarily interested in doing an MBA or a finance degree. And the, the differences are they are much more open to unstructured thinking. So, so for, hmm. for example, uh, an English major or a person who is 75, who has seen it all, is much more open to open-ended nebulous thinking, i.e., uh, if I don't show them the formula, they are very okay with it. <laughs> but but, but in the business school, if I don't apply closure and say, you know, this is the way you have to think or structure, you can get into trouble a little bit. Right? Not trouble. You know what right. I mean. I mean, people want structure. That is the biggest difference. So there'll be people who say, man, I watched these 10 videos and now I feel I know finance. But they are more likely to know the principles of finance and not the practical applications of finance. And it's much more likely to happen with the gen general audience than with the MBA type audience. Am I making sense? Sure. Or so they gravitate to more the philosophical underpinnings of finance. But in an MBA program, they gravitate more towards the applications. That I see. Sure. That, that, does, that does make sense, Gotham. For example, on a quiz or, or assignment, um, the, the online uh, students might even do better in some of the, uh, the last gens where it's more of an open-ended problem, and it requires them to, to be a little bit more creative. That's right. I see. Where the question itself um, is more confusing, right? Yeah. I see. I see. Dealing with the amb that's ambiguity. Right. That's right. I think we, and, and other, as, yes. as we train ourselves more and more, unfortunately, I think we also train ourselves to be more structured in society, more discipline-based. And I think the challenge there is a deeper one. How do we, on the other hand, be more open to ambiguity when you're, you know, so you're throwing a lot of structure on problem solving. Right. That, in some sense, goes against your ability to deal with ambiguity. So, so that problem, 
we have sure. to somehow deal with as we teach people. I see. Have Have you thought about ways to um, possibly get some of our online and in-class students to interact in some ways? Perhaps some um, limited assignments where they go in and and try to collect some threads of discussion and uh, you know, analyze things or engage in some dialogue? Are there any opportunities like that where they can learn from each other? Uh, I The opportunities certainly are there. I haven't done anything about it as of now, but what I'm planning to do, I'm on leave this year, but when I come back next year, I'm going to try and do something that's similar to a MOOC, but within the university. So this is right now not, this is a thought. Where there is okay. a chance okay. that I will be able to offer a finance class using technology, but for the broader audience of the university, not just the business school. And I want to first see how it works there, an engagement across disciplines, before I open it up to 80,000, right? So, so I, what I'm okay. a concern is when you have huge, large numbers, a discussion can go totally out of control too. So I don't want to manage right. it too much, right. but I want to first experiment in an internal environment where I know how what the glitches are before I introduce it to a much larger audience. So that's my only hesitation. Yeah, no, that that's a plan if you if you have an opportunity to do something like that within the university. Um, one question for you: How has your core, online course changed over over the sessions that you offered it? The online course, and this is one of the legitimate issues about online courses, is about eighty percent of the investment is upfront. Because when I do an online class, I think this is true of almost every top university. It doesn't substitute for my other work. In other words, an online class, the way we are doing at Michigan right now, is uh -huh. over and above what your workload is otherwise. I see. We do it because we want to do it. We are doing it on a very selective faculty basis. We have a little stipend. I now am special counsel to the provost on online education, so I've been thinking about these issues, but it's largely being done by faculty because they want right. to do it. Right. So the upfront costs or efforts are huge. So for a class like mine, the changes that I do are at a margin. Remember, it's only been a year and a half. So nothing that I teach requires to be redone because these are fundamental concepts of finance that have been there for hundreds of years. But yeah. the applications I plan to change. So the way I grade them, the way I assess them, and that's very time intensive, Charlie. I mean, to create a problem that's a good problem. Takes right. a long time to test it. So my hope is that once I start experimenting on campus and the MOOC will change with the on-campus experimentation because it will feed off of each other. But to put too much effort every year is very difficult sure. to move because it's very intensive. Sure. And I I can see how you necessarily need to make a lot of wholesale content changes, but has your approach to managing the MOOC um, yes. or coordinating it changed? How so? So in the first time, I was pretty much engaged actively myself. I refused to go to the forums because of my personality, because if I go to the forum, I'll stay there all day, <laughs> and I have a full-time job. Right? Right. So my TA helped me on the forums. So what he did is he mon monitored it on a daily basis and brought up all issues that were common to me. And remember, mm -hmm. Coursera's forums has a thumbs up and the thumbs down. So if you get 10 thumbs up and 15 down, you're teaching each other. So you do not want to interfere too much. People are teaching each other, which is very powerful, right? Sure. So yeah. the one thing that has changed over the courses is we now use community TAs. So this is Coursera's idea. So people who did well in my past class, I approved about 10 of them to help my uh, teaching assistant oh. to oh. monitor the forums. I see. And that has been fascinating. So they are so engaging. So if somebody says something silly, 
in a very nice way, they'll answer that person and point them to the right direction, but not give the answer. And that, to me, has been, to me, the best thing about this is that the forum should be monitored by the students. And as you learn more, yes. you teach others without giving the answers out. So that development, to be honest, had nothing to do with me. But I feel like that's the way I would approach future classes is no I one see. expert. I you see. know what I mean? And I'm, you would spend time. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, and you would spend time with those community TAs to yes. help them. And so now my TA works with the community TAs who work, then I work with my TA. So it's it's a it's a arm's length relationship with the students because you don't want to answer all the questions, but at the same time enabling and helping them whenever there's need for help. Sure, sure. That sounds like a that sounds like a an excellent approach. Yes. Okay, Gotham, just one or two one or two more questions for you. Um, more generally about um, the topic of finance, I guess one question for you is, do you think that the image of, of finance has been tarnished um, over the past you know, five or ten years with, with economic, macroeconomic issues and, and financial scandals and, and things of this nature? What's, what's your perspective on that? My personal perspective is absolutely it's been tarnished. Uh, I genuinely believe, and I, I know I, uh, people think that I'm, you know, you, you know, being silly, but I'm not. I think finance is probably the best thing invented by humans. I genuinely believe that, and the fact that it's applied in a in a in a very narrow space of uh, valuing private companies only or projects is sad. On top of it, if people in the finance industry they also misbehave based on incentives. It gives finance a bad name. But I don't think finance yeah. is to blame here. It's, I think, the incentive structures that have led to this problem. And to be honest with you, our lack of understanding of systemic problems. So again, it goes to nonlinearity. We are very good when things are progressing on a very systematic basis. But when we see these extreme events, like the housing crash, which rarely happens for the whole country, we will, right? right? We do not know what's going on. So, so, so to me, it's the combination of extreme events and bad incentives, and not finance really, that that caused the problems. But you're absolutely right that the financial industry was the epicenter of everything happening over the last five to ten years, and it did get tarnished. We see it in our MBA programs too, that the interest, I believe, in a purely financial career mm. has gone down among students. And uh, it's sad because I think now is the time you need people who understand finance. You, you know, when things are going well, even if you don't know what the heck is going on, it doesn't really matter, <laughs> right? right. It, it's when things are not working well that you need knowledge. And that's sad, is that it's kind of, it's I true see. that people say, ah, this finance, they associate knowing finance with doing bad stuff, which is not true. Humans do bad stuff. Finance doesn't do bad stuff. So sure. that, I think people are caught up in the phase that the financial industry did all everything wrong. Not true. It's a combination of not knowing what the heck is going on plus bad incentives. So I see. Gotham, one, one thing you mentioned earlier is you said that um, you think that finance is one of the, the greatest invention uh, by humans. But, but let me ask you a question. Would you say that the core principles of finance invented or, dis or were discovered? And, and I, I, I'm wondering if you kind of get my meaning yes. with that question. No, no, the invention word is <laughs> wrong. It is okay. the beauty of finance is the finance articulates what's inside our guts. That's the beauty of finance. Is finance is so intuitive that I, the way I teach a MOOC, which is slightly different than, I never show a formula. I always do an example, mm -hmm. and then the formula pops out itself. So yes, you're absolutely right. We didn't invent it, but the way we set a framework around what is so intuitive 
is what I call finance. So it's a way of thinking that's extremely intuitive, but it requires navel gazing to kind of put structure around it. So, so in that sense, I, it was I, invented. So there, Am I so, so 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 the way of thinking was kind of invented in the uh, in the early 90s, 19th century, formalized, but of course not invented. Invented because we knew it in the cave intuitively. You know the principles of. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So it's a discipline that has been developed, but it's based on uh, principles that are in the natural world that we have. Um, come to grasp and, and systematize in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's, the, it's the most natural of sciences to me. It's a scientific way of looking at human behavior, but mm -hmm. the most intuitive one. It's not I, I generally feel that nobody is shocked when they learn finance, really learn <laughs> it. You know, more, nobody comes around and says, oh man, this was completely alien to me. It's very a natural way of people thinking, but a formalized way. So that it puts a discipline on you, how you think about life. So, I see. Yeah. I see. Gotham, final question for you. Um, for student, for all of the students who've taken this course, uh, many, many tens of thousands, uh, they uh, become interested in finance because of this. What would you recommend for the next steps for them? How could they learn more? I think uh, my feeling is that how they learn more depends on two things. If, if they can, if they are fortunate enough to invest in their own education, I genuinely believe that face-to-face -face learning at working with others in a setting that's not the real world is extremely important. Because in the real world, you don't have the time. So if you have the time and resources, go to a good university and learn more finance and more business if you're interested in that, or philosophy, because finance is, has philosophy in it too. So whatever your passion is, and if you have the time to go there. But I do believe the MOOCs is much more powerful than we give it credit for. Yes, it has issues, but if you are anywhere in the world, do more advanced classes. So for example now, uh, Bob Schiller is offering a course on financial yeah. markets. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Take that class. Take a class by Franklin Allen, which is supposed to be from Wharton. He's a colleague of mine who I really admire. It's supposed to be the same class as mine. Take the same class mm -hmm. with a different person because the beauty of finance is you can, there's one answer. It's wrong to most questions. There's one answer. It's wrong. <laughs> but there are 15 ways of getting there. So the, the nice thing about something like finance is not learn it from one person. You have the opportunity of now multiple MOOCs at advanced levels. At least follow that because you can control that. Even if you don't have the resources to go to school, I would encourage you to do more and more finance. Sure. With another Do computer sciences. Because finance gets more technical and you need to know computer science, you need to know statistics. So though as much as I love finance, it's an applied field. So my advice would be do more economics, do more finance, and do more statistics to try to understand what the heck this complex field is all about. And you don't have to go to the university. And uh, Gotham, I really... Sure, and I, I really like your advice about taking another even intro to finance class because the way you're describing it is in a way of thinking. It's not just subject matter. So um, you can benefit from revisiting uh, concepts over and over again. No, to Charlie, to answer your question, there are only five things in life. If you internalize, you are, you are, you are cool. And... One is really understanding love. What love really means, if you can figure that out even 50% in life. <laughs> Lo not right. loving yourself, but loving right. humanity and right. everything. The other four are all in finance. So there are five things. One of them is love, the other four are in finance. So that's why I love what, finance. What are, the, what are the other four? Oh, I don't know what they are, but they're all in finance. Meaning... <laughs> 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 no, and I'm serious. So 
Finance is a way of thinking. It's Yes, you can solve problems of life using finance, but it's a way of thinking. So do it from different perspectives. And that's the beauty of it. It's both a science and an art. To pick up the art piece, you have to have different ways of thinking about it. So, I see. And, I see. Excellent. And and that that's also another reason why uh, working in collaboration, because it helps you uh, with that art piece as well. That's right. That's right. Uh, Gotham, well, I this has been a, a wonderful discussion. I appreciate it. And also, back on the uh, class that I took with you many years ago in the classroom, uh, it, it was very memorable, and it definitely sparked uh, a lot of... Uh, passion into me as well. I still remember you talking about, uh, I still remember your metaphysics, you know, love being the highest and then just under that finance. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is, there, is there anything else you wanted to add uh, based on this discussion or have we covered uh, most of the important topics? No, uh, we have covered. The one thing I would like to say finally is that I, I feel like like and and we, let's talk about love for a second. Uh, the nice thing about love is that you can talk about it all you want, but only when you feel it do you know what it is. And mm -hmm. so I feel the same about learning. I mean, yes, group learning is good. Yes, forums are good. Yes, a teacher, great teacher is good. But learning is like love. It is a very personal experience. It's a very human thing. Why? Because we have a brain, my dog doesn't. Mm. And so go to that every time. So whenever you're frustrated, recognize that it's not going to be easy. MOOCs are awesome because they are opening up new doors to your satisfying your own learning curiosity and you will grow. So that's yeah. my only advice, last parting thing is that I love education is because it's about you. It's not about a university. It's not about the system. It's about you. And that's my last point I wanted to make. I see. Well, thank you, Gotham, very much. I, I hope you have a, a great uh, a great end of the year and holiday and, and safe travels. And also enjoy your um, uh, uh, year off from, uh, from teaching as well. Thank you. And happy holidays. Happy New Year. Great talking to you. Okay, thanks, Gotham. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.